Um, good morning or good afternoon, I guess, to where you're depending, uh, where you're joining us from today. Um, thank you for taking the time to dial in to our webinar. Um, we've had a, a varied and wide response from people, which really shows the, um, the great interest around Vibrios at the moment. Um, we've got a number of people joining us from New Zealand. Uh, we've also got quite a few regulators, um, all from health departments, food safety and market access. Um, we've also got research organisations and a number of um, industry people across a, a wide range of seafood sectors. So thank you all for taking the time to come and join us today. I'm hoping that you'll get a lot out of this presentation. All right, to start off, uh, I'd just like to introduce myself. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Natalie Dowsett and I'm the Executive Officer of SafeFish. Um, I will be hosting today, so if you do have any issues, please um, send me a message in chat and I'll try to help you out on, on my end. Um, the other very important wheel in the Safe Fish cog is Alison Turnbull. She is our pro program manager. Um, she will be giving you a little presentation about what Safe Fish is and how we've come to hosting the series today around Vibrios. And she'll also introduce you to our expert who will be delivering the majority of the web content today. Um, so before we begin, um, and in the spirit of reconciliation, on behalf of SafeFish, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Thank you all for joining us today um, and I'll just hand over now to Alison who will give you a bit of um, an update on Safe Fish and DJ. Thanks, Nat. Um, hopefully, most of you will already have come across Safe Fish in some form or another. We're a long-standing program that successfully supported seafood safety and market access for Australian seafood for over a decade now. The program started under the auspices of the Australian Seafood CRC when it was recognised that international trade in seafood is big business and Australia really is a very small fish in this pond. In order to make headway in both our domestic and international endeavours, we really had to use a science-based approach and develop strong evidence base to underpin our risk management and market access. So we're funded by a wide range of seafood industry stakeholders and the Australian Government through the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. Our work program is overseen by a partnership of regulators, industry members and research organisations. And it's this partnership that has been the strength of our success, um, where we work together and we develop relationships that have stood us in really good stead when we have any issues that come up. We focus on the highest priority issues affecting any seafood. And this is because we know that an outbreak or an illness in any particular seafood will affect sales and market access for a much broader range of seafood. In order to determine what these high priority issues are, we run a very thorough process every three years, scanning Australian illnesses, recalls, trade detects, international trends, codex, and seeking input from all the stakeholders to the seafood industry. Our last process was in 2019, and you can see here that the, the issues that were related highly. Of course, Vibrio in bivalve seafood was one of these issues, and this was based mainly on the increased illnesses we were seeing caused by Vibri para, Vibrio parahemolyticus associated with oysters in Australia. Here is a high level summary of the data that we pulled together for that prioritisation process. Individual cases of Vibrio are not notifiable in all states. So this table only includes the Northern Territory, Western Australia, South Australia and Tasmania where Vibrio parahemolyticus is a notifiable disease. And you can see that we have had cases in all of these states commonly associated with oysters. And importantly, the source has been confirmed as originated from all of the big volume oyster producing states, New South Wales, Tasmania and South Australia, and could also have potentially come from WA. So this is an issue that should be of concern for all states in Australia. It is also an issue that is not going away. 
This table includes data up to March 2019, and it's my understanding that we've had at least another 10 illnesses reported across Australia since that time. The good news is that we're not alone here. Fibriosis is on the rise globally, and there are others that have gone before us and whom we can learn from. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Dorothy Jean McCubrey. So Dorothy is our expert for this webinar series. DJ is a, a long-standing colleague of mine who, like me, cut her teeth at the coalface of shellfish quality assurance. I first met DJ when she was a shellfish specialist in New Zealand. This was a big role that provides scientific and technical support to all of the shellfish quality assurance managers in New Zealand, as well as having input into policy to improve risk management. Since 2007, DJ has been an international shellfish consultant and has often assisted Australia with independent, high quality advice relating to such things as viruses, biotoxins and US market access. She has also worked for the FAO and the US FDO, FDA, and of relevance to this webinar, DJ completed her PhD in the United States on food safety science and governance using vibriosis amongst seafood consumers as the exploratory lens. So Safefish is really pleased to be able to work with Dorothy Jean to bring you this webinar series. Our first webinar will focus on the science of vibrios. The second web webinar tomorrow will focus more on what we can practically do to reduce the risk. And next week, we will end with a third webinar where we'll discuss international examples of risk control and facilitate a discussion on what type of guidance, if any, is required in Australia. So without any further ado, I will hand you on to Dorothy Jean McCubrey. Okay, thank you, Ali. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you very much, Natalie, for all the hard work that you have done in the background to set this program up for us. Um, Natalie has shared with me the list of attendees today. And it's great to see so many names that I know. So hello to everybody and welcome to my dining room table. It's a large dinner party today of more than 100 folk. Now, I realize that you are sitting in different places, both geographically and you have different roles with regards to seafood. But a common theme that we all share is an interest in food safety. Extremely important attribute when you're selling or dealing with food, your customers expect it, and more importantly, it's such an intrinsic value that the World Health Organization has declared a safe food supply as a human right. So today, I'm going to give you a very broad brush introduction to Vibrios. I'm going to introduce them to you. I'm going to talk about the risks that they expose us to and options that we might be able to do to try and manage those human health risks. As I said, it's a broad brush general introduction, and I know many of you out there will be highly skilled in particular areas. I'm happy to share more detail with you later on, or even argue if you disagree with some of my interpretations around the science. But let's crack on and see what we can do. Now, if we were all meeting 100 years ago, we would have had our focus on Vibrio cholera because at that stage, Vibrio cholera was causing huge problems around the world, particularly with seafood eaters, causing large-scale outbreaks and death. But fortunately, with good science and sensible public policies, which introduced potable drinking water supplies and managed sewage disposal, we've actually controlled and dominated and got rid of the Brio cholera in most countries. We took control of the situation. And we often nowadays, we expect to be able to do the same. We commonly think that human beings are set aside from nature and in control of our own environment. Certainly Vibrio gave us a little bit of a shake up around that concept, and it was a bit of a shock to realize that a single organism can bring down whole governments and um, affect people around the world. But even so, within 12 months, we've, scientists have managed to find us various vaccinations and we're slowly going to work our way through the problem again with good science and good policy. 
So let's crack on and see what we can learn about the Vibrios and how we're doing in that particular sphere. Right. The first person to actually see a Vibrio bacteria that we know of was an Italian called Filippo Pacino, who was trying to find out the cause of Vibrios. And down his old-fashioned light microscope in 1854, he saw this quivering, shivering little organism, and he named it Vibrio, or Latin for quiver. Now, rather than continue my program today, I'm sure the microbiologists would like a more sophisticated definition of Vibrio species rather than a quivering comma. For, so for those microbiologists, it's a halophilic organism. In other words, it likes salty environments. It's gram-negative, oxidase positive. It has a flagella or a tail, which assists its movement, and it does not form any kind of spores. Since the finding of cholera, scientists have gone on to find at least another 78 Vibrio species in the marine environment and there will be more that we have yet to find. Many of them, we really don't understand their interaction with the environment, but we have nailed down at least 20 species and their positive and negative effects in the marine environments. Some are actually good little critters. For example, squid, which has a light on its tail, would not be able to operate effectively without a symbiotic relationship with a Vibrio species. Other Vibrio species actually cause marine life harm and they can be the bane of the fish industry when they cause salmon or eel diseases. And there are other ones that affect abalone, etc. But when it comes to us, the two-legged beasts, there's only 12 that we know affect us. Some of them cause things like swimmer's ear, that's Vibrio alginolyticus, or skin infections for those who are recreating or working in the saltwater environment. But we know at least make us, at least eight species make us ill if we actually eat them. And two are of primary concern around the world nowadays, and those are Vibrio vulnificus and Vibrio parahemolyticus. So where do we find these Vibrios, the wider group of um, the family? Well, they're ubiquitous in the marine and estuarine environments. And ubiquitous is just a big word for meaning that everywhere in the marine and estuarine environments. In the warmer tropical areas, you can go out and find Vibrios at any point in time in the water, the sea life, the seafood, or the silt. Whereas in the temperate climates, during the colder months, it gets a little bit harder to find them, simply because when it gets cold, they hunker down into the marine silts and remain dormant until the weather gets a little bit warmer. But believe me, they are out there all the time. And it's important for us to appreciate that they're totally unrelated to pollution. There's nothing that human beings are doing to make them grow faster or um, be in more prolific environments. They are there naturally in their marine environment and therefore totally unrelated to the E. coli or other indicators that we use for the microbiology shellfish quality assurance programs. Now, if I was asked to give a theme song for the Vibrios, I would say it's don't fence me in, simply because you can't. There's no way that we can fence them in because they are constantly traveling in the world's oceanic currents. They're getting picked up by fish life, bird life, and other organisms that are interacting with the marine environment. And they can even be natural well, present in the ballast water of ships. So you can imagine with that scenario, they are constantly moving around the world's environment. And it's not possible to put up a barbed wire fence and put them inside that. I know today's talk is really meant to be focused on Vibrio parahemolyticus, which we will come to. But before that, I wanted to talk about the other Vibrio you're very likely to come up against. 
And you often come up against it in the media because I call it the paparazzi vibrio because it makes for such sensational headlines. You'll open the paper or hear on the TV, the world's most deadly pathogen strikes again. 50% of people will die. It's a flesh-eating organism and we've had to chop off somebody's arm or leg. And Natalie has put on the slide there for me some headliners from Australian media places which talk about the Vibrio vulnificus bacteria. All of those slogans are indeed correct, but let me put it into more context for you. Um, most people will suffer no adverse consequences associated with Vibrio vulnificus. A few people might suffer a low dose of mild diarrhea if they eat them. Or if people are strolling and exposing themselves to seawater and you have an open wound of any kind, the Vibrios are likely to burrow into your skin. For most people, that is not a problem. But for people who are susceptible or in the at-risk group, there is a very high risk of that eating or the wound infection giving you septicemia or blood poisoning. And that's not good. You either die from the blood poisoning or unfortunately to stop the infection, the um, surgeons will either have to chop off your toes, fingers, arms or legs and often multiple um, parts of your body, which is very sad, or debride or remove the skin from a large part of your body where the wound has infected. So it's not a great look. The Vibrio vulnificus is found in water 13 degrees and above, but quite frankly, it's really a tropical disease. They like very warm water. And rather than oceanic tropical water, they really prefer brackish environments. So the Gulf of Mexico in the United States, it's prime Vibrio vulnificus country simply because the water is usually warm all year round and with the large rivers such as the Mississippi discharging into the Gulf, the water is not very salty and that's where the Vibrio vulnificus loves to breed. Now, before you lie awake at night worrying about whether you're going to have to manage this organism in your career, let me give you a little bit more context. This organism only causes sporadic cases. In other words, individual people here and there. There are never large outbreaks of people with this disease. They're immunocompromised, as I mentioned before, and the person most likely to suffer from Vibrio vulnificus is male, over 50, and with liver damage, often caused by high alcohol consumption. Now, I hope that doesn't leave too many of my audience shivering in your boots after that definition. But there are medical and physiological reasons why that group is the at-risk group. But even so, in the largest hot spot in the world, which is the United States, which has a population of at least 350 million people, there are only approximately 60 cases a year or an incidence rate of 0.5 per million head of population. It's a bad disease, but it's not a highly prevalent disease. And even those in the at-risk group, most people will still safely eat oysters and not suffer the consequences, but we would never recommend an immunocompromised person eat raw shellfish. Okay, that's my story about Vibrio vulnificus. Let's move on to what we really want to talk about today, the outbreak troublemaker. I'll just mention one more thing about vulnificus before I turn on to this. We think that we get most of the cases. We don't think there's very much under-reporting of Vibrio vulnificus because the symptoms are so serious and they're so visual. You'll get big black um, bruises on your arms and legs which then start to rot in front of your eyes. So because the symptoms are so visual and dramatic, most people end up in the hospital very quickly. But then we come to this one which we're going to focus on today, which is Vibrio parahemolyticus. 
And please let me start calling it by a short name. I'll call it BP from now on. It's bad enough trying to spell the name, let alone use Vibrio parahemolyticus repeatedly through my talk. So we'll now revert to a common name of VP. VP is incredibly common. In fact, we now believe it's the world's most common microbial um, illness associated with eating seafood. It surpasses virus problems. It surpasses um, any other microbial illness. And it's usually associated with eating raw seafood. And I'll explain the reason for that soon. And for those people unlucky enough to get gastro, get ill from this, you will suffer gastroenteritis. But we often get large outbreaks associated with this organism. For example, in 2005 in Chile, they estimated 4,000 cases over a short term got ill from eating mussels. So it is a significant illness burden problem for us. Um, I said it's everywhere, and I have a large cardboard box in my garage, which has, ha has multiple references and papers from around the world of where VP cases have happened. And all I've done here is I've got my colouring in pen and traced around where I know outbreaks have occurred. Ali, thank you for the earlier information. I'm now going to get my colouring pen and stretch it around the coastline a little bit more of Australia. But let me assure you, the coastline that hasn't been coloured in, that doesn't mean they don't have a problem. It simply means that I haven't read about it or the reference is not in my cardboard box. And I can already see that Thailand, I should have um, a yellow marker there too. Honestly, VP occurs all around the world in all sorts of countries and cultures. Unfortunately, as Ali alluded to earlier, the rates are increasing. And it's not just the number of people who are suffering VP that is increasing. It also seems that we're getting more geographical diversity in the places. Earlier on in um, VP's history, we thought it was really most commonly related to the tropical zones. But over recent years, we've noticed the spread is going from the equator out to the various poles. And in recent years, we've had a Vibrio VP outbreaks turn up in unexpected places, for example, Alaska or the southern area of Chile. So it is a problem that we are more and more likely to come across in our daily life in the next few years. This little slide I gained access to when I was actually working for the FDA. And Ali, I didn't get a PhD in um, US. That's a New Zealand PhD, but I did use new American data. Um, now, this little um, slide, and it is getting slightly old now, but that doesn't matter. All I wanted you to see is that for so many food safety pathogens, we're on top of our game. We have reduced salmonella, campylobacter, listeria, E. coli, but unfortunately, the VP numbers or the general vibriosis numbers are still rising. And vibriosis is the term meaning somebody has become ill from eating vibrio bacteria. Why are they increasing? I can posit many reasons for you. Climate change being the first. Now, we could debate later on during our discussion time whether climate change is man-made or whether it's just a natural evolution of the world. But whatever the cause, there is absolutely no doubt that our sea temperatures are changing and generally getting warmer for longer. The icebergs are melting. The Brios themselves are actually quite nimble little critters and they're constantly evolving and changing their genetic makeup. And we think maybe some of the new strains are actually more aggressive and more potent to human beings than they did before. But maybe it's that we are just getting old. If you look at most developed countries in the world, we have an aging population. And as well as wrinkles and crinkles, old age actually reduces our immune systems. 
and so we are more susceptible to diseases as we get older. Seafood dietary patterns have also changed around the world. Many countries had traditional food safety mechanisms to protect seafood eaters. For example, some countries only ate shellfish during the cold winter months. Other areas like North Carolina only ever ate barbecued oysters. They never ever ate them raw in tropical areas. But nowadays it's highly fashionable in some countries to go to a raw bar and eat a platter full of oysters sourced from all around the world, paying huge amounts of money for each oyster and then slurping it back raw along with a bottle of a glass of bubbles at the same time. So our dietary patterns are changing and traditional wisdom is often no longer there. And then lastly, but not least, we may simply be better at diagnosing vibrios. Nowadays, if somebody goes to a doctor suffering diarrhea, the doctor can tick a few boxes on his lab check sheet and the lab has very sensitive and specific and cheap assays which can quickly test for a broad spectrum of pathogens. So it may be the increase in our VP numbers are simply because our lab people are much better at finding them. In other words, I have no freaking idea why we've got more Vibrios. They are increasing. It's likely to be one of those factors or a combination of those factors. But the reality is we are getting increasing numbers in increasingly different environments. Um, now, my talk is going to be a general meandering conversation, as you have probably already gathered. So in case you go to sleep throughout it and I can't see you to throw the blackboard duster at you to wake you up, every now and again, I'm going to have a little slide which shows the key messages that I want you to remember by the time you leave today. And after that first session, I want you to know that Vibri's, Vibrio's are natural. We're not doing anything wrong to introduce them. They're out there in the marine world as of their own right. They are found globally in many parts of the world, if not most parts of the world. They are a leading cause of microbial illness in seafood eaters, and for some reason, the illness rates in human beings are increasing. So let's look at the science. What can science tell us about it? Well, the first people to find the Brio illness were the Japanese, who back in the 1950s found a large number of people becoming ill with diarrhea after eating semi-cooked sardines. The Japanese have since spent a lot of time focused on the Brios and their causes, as have multiple other scientists around the world. Some people have made their whole careers out of Vibrios. Um, and there are a multitude of different types of scientists studying Vibrios, including VP. There are the microbiologists who their job is to make the bacteria visible for us lay people. There are the marine biologists and the ecologists who need to help get a better understanding of the way Vibrios live in their marine environments. There are the epidemiologists, both the fish epidemiologists and the human epidemiologists. Remember, these organisms cause disease at fish farms and in fish. So the veterinarian cartel are very interested in protecting their fish species, as are the human epidemiologists who are constantly trying to form the association between illness and the particular bacteria. Then there are the environmental scientists and the modelers who are constantly striving to find some indicator that we can use to assess risk, some environmental factor such as temperature, salinity, or something else which will predict where and when VP outbreaks will occur. And we even have scientists now who specialise in satellite imagery who are tracking the ocean's temperature and the likely VP hotspots around the world. So it's a well-studied organism. I've snaffled this little um, slide here, and I don't need you to focus heavily on the detail, but I've taken it from the FAO guidelines because the United Nations 
also has working parties looking at the human health risk associated with VP. And they describe it as an organism that likes warm temperatures and relatively neutral pH, a salty environment and a watery environment. They cannot abide dry drying out. If VPs become desiccated, they die. Um, they don't mind an aerobic or anaerobic environment. So provided the seawater or the silt is nice and salty, warm and a relative pH, they will thrive. And if anybody later on wants more scientific detail around the characteristics, I can supply that. But really, um, the key temperatures that I'd like you to be interested in during this session is the fact that once the temperature, the seawater and the air temperature cools down to 10 degrees or less, the, they begin to go to sleep. That's when they start to hunker down into the silt of the marine environment and hibernate. Um, and we know if we take them out of the marine environment, they won't grow in the fridge either. They don't like the cold very much. If you start warming the seawater up to 15 degrees, you'll only really find low levels of VP bacteria within seafood. And for some reason, Below 15 degrees, we don't get illness associated with seafood, and that's probably because they're just getting used to being back into the, the watery environment and they haven't got enough punch to multiply into large numbers or switch on their pathogenic or disease-causing issues. Um, once we get the temperature up between 20 and 25, man, they love it, and they multiply rapidly. As I said before, they don't like the cold. So if you reduce the temperature down to the domestic freezing level, all they will do is go to sleep. VT, VP will become latent, but be ready to wake up and become viable or alive again as soon as they warm up and start to thaw after being in the freezer. Now, the good news is, Mild heat kills VP. So what I'm talking about is around about 50 degrees for five minutes. In fact, most recipes which cook seafood will quickly kill the VP bacteria. If you have a mussel fritter or something in a fry pan and you flop it over a few times to get browned on both sides, you'll kill any VP. And many recipes which grill oysters with a nice succulent topping will also kill VP, provided that high temperature gets right through to the very middle. That's the key, is cooking seafood well, or sufficient to kill the back too. Please don't make it rubbery, but cook it well. Right, let's go back to the organism's favourite temperature, which is between 20 and 25. Now, within this temperature range, they are one of the fastest growing microbes that we know and they will double every 27 minutes. They multiply extremely quickly and they will be within tens of thousands in your seafood quickly if the seafood is held at that rate. Now, I keep talking about seafood as though it's something special and a particularly bad rap when it comes to VP. The reality is, the only reason seafood is associated with Vibrio bacteria is because it lives in the same environment. It's a neighbour of the VP bacteria in their natural environment. We often think that shellfish is particularly bad and because of their filter feeding mechanisms, there's no doubt that they can absorb and concentrate whatever they're feeding on. And the other thing with shellfish is often it's eaten raw. It's not cooked in any way and had a lethal step, particularly oysters and mussels, but clams are often eaten raw too. So any shellfish that is eaten raw will be pro potentially problematic. But please remember that any seafood that is eaten raw can be a problem. So sashimi, sushi, anything with raw fish in it, 
um, raw seafood, seaweed can be a problem. In fact, an outbreak was even occurred on a cruise ship where they used ice made out of seawater. The chefs made the ice out of seawater and then sprinkled it over the um, buffet to keep the seafood fresh and safe. But of course, it was the infected ice that caused the um, bacteria. Now, for those who um, eat seafood and are unfortunate enough to take a swig of VP um, bacteria at the same time, what you're likely to suffer from is gastroenteritis. Very, very rarely septicemia. And those who suffer from septicemia or blood poisoning are people who are immunocompromised and suffering some other disease. Those people we would always suggest avoid raw protein of any kind, whether it be seafood, raw meat, or raw eggs or milk. But most people will only suffer a mild dose of diarrhea, which starts around about 17 hours after eating the shellfish. And that's when they'll need to go on the hunt for a WC rather quickly. Most of the time it's over within a short time, two to five days. But as you can see for both the incubation period and the illness duration, those figures are the median and there is a range of um, timelines either side. But most of the case, it's a mild illness. Hospital care is very unusual and death is extremely unusual, but again, usually because the person is suffering from some other disease, which makes them more susceptible to illness. Right, we do, I did explain before, it's a global problem and we do have pandemics. Um, now I want to just quickly run you through what a pandemic means for a Vibrio. Usually when we use the term pandemic, we have in our mind it's a bacteria that infects a high proportion of the world's population. And indeed, COVID reminds us what a pandemic is all about. A pandemic in the usual terminology is a disease that's running rampant around the world at the one time. When it comes to talking about pandemic strains for VP or any other Vibrio, it's slightly different. It means a strain that has become dominant around and spreads to other countries around the world. And our scientists are getting better and better at the genealogy of uh, VP and Vibrios, and they can now track where certain strains start and how they move around the world, either by taking environmental samples or clinical samples. I've put two VP strains up there, the O3K6 and the O4K12, and they actually are quite um, tough little critters, making and they seem to be more pathogenic, able to cause more severe symptoms and more numbers. Um, so, yes, they are. Those two have been particularly tracked around the world because they have come to our attention more often than maybe some of the other strains. Right. Now, we've come a long way since old Filippo looking down his light microscope. Nowadays, scientists around the world have got a number of different scientific tools to make the brios more visible to us. We, of course, have the agar plates, but we've moved on a long way since then too. We now have molecular technology. We have real-time PCR technology, which can quickly tell us how many and what type of the brios are present in clinical or environmental strains. We even can go so far as to delve right into the gene knowns of those bacteria. So you can imagine what sophisticated visual techniques we need to go right into the bacteria and see what their genetics are like. But we have all that science at our fingertips, which has now made VP more visible for us and taught us a lot more about it than poor old Filippo had when he was looking down his grimy Science, and as I say, with all that new science, which is coming on stream all the time, science can now really help us look at clinical and environmental samples. So clinical samples 
are those specimen, body specimens. When you go to the doctor and you fill a little container up for, with feces or some other body fluid, that it's highly likely that when that goes to the lab now, they'll be able to sift their way through it and accurately define how many Vibrios are there and what type they are and what species they are. The same with environmental samples. Nowadays, we can go out and collect seafood samples, sediment samples, and even water samples. And the scientists relatively quickly and easily can tell us more about the species of VP that is there. Further, they can even tell us something about the genealogy of it um, and describe some of the particular features of the strain that they're looking at. When I mentioned the Japanese um, dealt with the VP back in the 1950s, they were one of the first to notice that 90% of the clinical strains that they dealt with had a particular feature associated. They had the TDH gene, whereas only 1% of the environmental samples seem to have that same TDH gene. And so they formed a test which determined whether the Vibrio was Kanagawa positive, i.e. had the TDH gene or not. At that stage, we thought, oh, we've got a very simple way of deciding which Vibrio is pathogenic. But like most things in life, the devil is in the detail. And since then, we have found that that is not necessarily the case. The genetics around Vibrios switch on and off a number of features about the behaviour of the VP organisms. And they can secrete a number of things, and we have a number of serotypes, and we have a number of strains. Sadly, it is now wrong to think that any of these key features always means that the VP is pathogenic. Sometimes one of those features is there. Sometimes all of those features are there in the VP that causes illness. But moreover, sometimes the VP that causes illness has none of those features there. So they're tricky little critters. So... I come to the complexity of the situation now. This is why scientists are still making a career out of VP. Not all VP causes illness. You can go out into the environment and you might find tens of thousands of VP out in the general environment but have absolutely no illness. The number of VP, intuitively, you would think the more there are, the more likely it is that people will get sick. And usually that is the case for the pathogenic dose of any microorganism. We used to think that VP was caused by very high numbers of VP in seafood, and there used to be standards which said that you're allowed up to 10,000 per gram of seafood. We've now wiped all of those standards because we found it wasn't foolproof. Sometimes you will never be able to find the VP in the shellfish, but you will have outbreaks. And so it's wrong to think that we have nailed the pathogenic dose. Don't be frightened by high levels in your shellfish if you don't have illness. So why do we have this complexity? Why is it so hard to determine the situation? Well, that's because of the Vibrios being so lively themselves. They're very adaptable and they're very nimble. They are constantly changing their genetic framework and they're constantly adapting to their physical environment. So they're actively working all the time. And in combination, the actual physical environment is constantly changing. Any of us who run a shellfish program know that seasons are different every year. One year you'll get a very wet summer, one time a very dry summer. We have El Nino and La Nina that we deal with here. The, the, envir the physical environment is not static and nor are the Vibria organisms. So 
they're constantly reforming their balance, which means that we will get regional differences with the various VP strains. I'll go so far as to say in Washington State, in America, which has a large sound called the Puget Sound, you'll have bays right beside one another, neighbouring bays, where one, day, one bay will be problematic for VP illness and the bay beside will have no illnesses, yet they have very similar VP flora. Science has told us a lot, and we do know a lot more, but let's get real, we have to face reality. Science doesn't know everything yet. We don't have clear indication as to what makes VP pathogenic. We don't have a single marker or suite of markers where we can point the finger and say, that VP is guilty, Your Honour. We don't really yet understand the infective dose, and that, de that depends on the strain of VP that we're dealing with in the particular region. Sometimes it might take a lot, but sometimes it might be that there's very few requ uh, required in the environment to cause a clinical problem. And we're as yet unable to predict or control Vibrio parahemolyticus when it's in its own environment, when it's in the watery marine environment. Okay, wake up. Here's my key message slide in case you've gone to sleep. What I've been saying in that long conversation is not all Vibrios and not all VP organisms are pathogenic. Science can describe very well um, if you send them a sample from a clinical specimen or an environmental specimen, they can clearly and quickly tell you how many VP there and tell you their particular attributes. And that is a useful tool when we're fingerprinting an illness outbreak. It's really nice if you can find the same VP in the clinical samples and then find that mirror image in the seafood itself. But as yet, science is not good at predicting when and where the Brio illness will occur. And that's a, a, a situation all around the world, not just in the southern hemisphere. So I can hear you saying, well, this is a waste of my time. I came to get the learning, the easy tricks about what to do about managing my food safety risk. So let me talk a little bit about that so that you don't feel I've cheated you in some way. Um, of course, illness is a risk. Um, anybody who's involved in food, that's their worst nightmare, is making their customers sick. But anybody involved in food will tell you, well, it's a lot more complicated than that. I've got many people sitting on my shoulder, breathing down my neck. I've got my markets overseas who want me to comply with their regulation. And if they're not trusting my source, they will switch off my market very quickly. I have my reputational brand to consider. And for the regulators, you have your country's reputation to consider. So you don't want illnesses or you don't want to be seen to be a little bit lax in your management. And of course, we constantly have the media who often get the story wrong. But it's all very well if the story's wrong. If your name's been splashed across the front page of a thing, it's a devil of a job to get the um, consumer's trust back. So there are multiple risks, not least of all that, that hardy regulator or auditor who is breathing down a company's neck wanting to see their food safety plan and why they haven't done X, Y or Z to manage the Vibrio risk. For those industry people listening, um, I have some questions you could ask yourself quietly to see if your product might have a significant VP risk. I'd suggest you ask yourself, do I sell raw seafood? Do I harvest my seafood from waters when it's warmer than 15 degrees Celsius? Is my seawater sometimes brackish? Is it affected by fresh water flows off the land or large rivers? Do you grow shellfish in the intertidal zone where it's often a bit warmer and closer to the silts? Do I have a farming operation that requires me to pull my seafood out of the water, play with it and then put it back into the water? Land-based activities such as sizing or rumbling or cleaning seafood. 
Are there any delays between harvesting and refrigerating your product? And do you operate with a post-harvest environment of greater than 10 degrees Celsius? I won't belabor this slide because we are moving on, the clock is moving on, but I will come back to these temperatures. Remember, keep these temperatures in mind. Cooling down reduces your risk. Heating actually gets rid of the problem altogether. But the reality is we are all walking a risk tightrope. Every day in each of our jobs, we are exposed to food safety risks or professional risks that we have to manage. Now, I haven't stolen the slide from the Northern Territory. Let me assure you that they're not the only people dealing with salt water crocodiles. Each of us has our own alligator snapping at our heels every day, and we're each trying to manage our own professional risk, not only the industry. So what will it require to manage and reduce our food safety risks as much as possible when it comes to BP? Certainly, we must use the best science that we have at hand at the moment. We need to use good management techniques and we need practical thinkers. In my career, I've been involved with scientists and I have been a regulator and I've dealt a lot with the industry. And my experience of all three groups, it's the industry who are the practical thinkers. So what does best management plans look like or best management practice look like? It's not simply pointing the finger at the industry person saying, your product, your problem, your fault. Prove to us that you can manage this risk. It's much more extensive than that. Best management practice means that we have good epidemiology systems who can quickly determine when there is a VP problem or other food poisoning outbreaks and can quickly and accurately attribute the source of the seafood. It's so easy to point the finger at the local industry when often further explanation finds that it's an either imported seafood or seafood from another state. So timely investigation is incredibly important. Being prepared, even if you don't have a VP problem now, you should, as a state, be thinking about it. What am I going to do if suddenly we have a VP problem tomorrow? Do I have a lab that I can send the samples to? Do I have a good communication tree that I can tell all my industry that there is a problem? Can I quickly close down an area till we find out more? And for the industry, when you've been closed down, can you promptly find an alternative safe seafood source to keep your customers satisfied? It's thinking ahead like any civil defence plan. There are some best practice tricks that I can give you regarding farming and harvesting, and I will focus on those more tomorrow. But it's also important that your customers are kept briefed. Your customers being the wholesalers, the retailers, the restaurants, and your consumers themselves, that they understand their role in treating your seafood with respect and treating their personal health risk with respect. They should be putting the seafood directly promptly into the refrigerator, not the trunk of the car and then going off to get me here or the nails done. Um, and if you have immune compromised people, please, please make sure that they know that really it's not worth their while to try and eat raw meat, raw eggs or raw seafood. Let's be upfront now. I can solve some of your problems, but there's no way I can eliminate the problem in the, in the water. I can't put a barbed wire fence up for you or I can. I cannot irradiate the water and zap the problem. We have to accept that if we want to live with seafood, we also live with VP who are naturally living in the marine environment. Hey, I can fix your problem for you, though. If you give me all your harvested seafood, I can solve the problem for you by applying a food technology process to it. I can irradiate your seafood. I can put it into a high pressure chamber and squash the living daylights out of those vibrios. 
I can pasteurize it or put it into a cryogenic freezer and a few other food technologies. Now, before you go nuts, I can hear you out there now saying, that's not what my consumers want. My consumers eat seafood because it's a natural product. It's fresh. It's got that briny taste. It's straight out of the water. My customers want fresh and natural. And I always remember a regulator who knew the problems with VP and oysters associated from the Gulf of Mexico. And he said, there's no way I'm going to have a pasteurized oyster. DJ, if you eat a pasteurized oyster, it's like taking the fizz out of my soft drink. It's not the same. No matter what the health consequences are, give me a raw oyster any day. So if that's the way your customers are feeling, that's fine. We, we um, need to accept that and then look at how we can manage the risks that we are left with when you freshly harvest shellfish. And we do have some points where we can mitigate the potential problems. There will be times when we pull the shellfish out of the water and there is an infective dose and there's nothing we can do about it. But there are farming steps that we can do to reduce the problem. And there are harvesting and post-harvesting steps that we can do to reduce the proliferation of VP once they come out of the water. So my key messages in this section is we cannot, we can reduce the VP risk, but we cannot eliminate the problem if we look at the water space. We must realise harvesting fresh seafood is likely to be contaminated with VP or other Vibrio species. To manage the problem and reduce the food safety risk is going to require commitment from all of us no matter what our professional field. There are some sensible farm and harvest management tricks that I can teach you. And I know that Natalie sent you um, Tasmania's best management practice guide. And that might be a little bit of homework you like, might like to do tonight. Flip through that while you're in bed tonight, because we're going to talk about that more tomorrow. But it is going to come back to temperature control and what human beings have control of. Now, I can hear the people who are dealing with tropical oysters going, oh, I don't agree with that. You'll kill the oysters if you drop them to 10 degrees. We can go over that tomorrow. And I appreciate that chilling seafood of any kind, particularly live seafood such as oysters, mussels and clams, is a slowly reducing temperature, not a shock, because that will kill the shellfish, which is equally as bad. That was my last slide, Natalie. Now, I see that the time is, is going quickly, and I apologise if I've gone over, but I'm very happy to answer any questions, and I have plenty of time if anybody wants to continue the conversation. And I'm happy for people to say you're plain wrong, we don't agree with you, because I feel that we'll benefit from any scientific industry or regulator question or comment. So let's open up. <laughs>